Good morning. Ooh. If you were a camp counselor in the 90s, you've seen that movie 400 times. 400 times. So, you know, the enemy sometimes seems to be winning. But the story isn't over. And so today I want to tell you something. So years ago, and I realized after last night that people under 30 have probably never had a briefcase, seen a briefcase, carried a brief. They have no, and I realized last night they had no idea what I was talking about. So I'm going to try to explain using a non-briefcase because I actually have gotten rid of my briefcase. Um, I use a backpack now, you know, everybody uses a backpack, it's easier. But anyway, so, but years ago you would carry a briefcase. And so um, we went to, I went to seminary, got my master's degree and other pastors were in the class and the, the professor kind of sat us in a horseshoe shape and we were getting ready to have an exam. And so what you would do is you'd put your briefcase on the table like this and then you'd have two locks and the locks on each side would have three numbers. And so you'd have, you know, You'd start with zero, 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 or whatever. If you were lazy, you just left whatever they had. So it might be all zeros. So everybody pretty much had briefcase. They were all the way around, you know, and you could pop them up during class if you wanted to do something else during class, like play SimCity. Not that I ever did that. But um, anyway, SimCity's a game. Anyway, so I think it's still around. So... Um, we were getting ready for the exam, and the professor said, hey, we got a 15-minute break. You can go out. So I went out to go to the restroom. When I came back, I went to open my briefcase, and it was locked. And I was like, oh, man. And one of my friends said, Paul, who, by the way, is now a pastor down in Stewart, Paul says, uh, uh, they said, Paul locked your briefcase. And so I looked at it, and I went, 000, 111, 222, 333, flip. And my briefcase opened, and I'm like, no big deal. And then I saw his briefcase over there, and I thought, hmm. So I walked over to his briefcase, and I went, zero, 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 click, opened his briefcase, and I thought, hmm. So I closed his briefcase back and changed his combination to my social security number. And then I went back to my briefcase, took out the notes I needed, closed my briefcase, and locked it. So Paul, exactly. So Paul comes back in and, of course, doesn't know. And I see him. The professor says, all right, let's get ready for the test. And I see Paul go, hey. I can see him out of the corner of my eye. Hey, watch this. And he looks over at me. And I look down at my briefcase. I pop the lock, look right at him, and open it. And he goes... How? How? And so I gave him a couple minutes, and then I gave him my social security number across the room, which he later used to open credit. No, he didn't. I'm just kidding. And popped the thing. It was the best moment of revenge ever in my life. And it happened within five minutes. I mean, it was like this successful, I'm going to defeat. And I could see his face as he saw me open his briefcase in confusion. How in the world did you get your briefcase open? And then, oh no, this is awful. I've not thought this out. It was awesome. And here's the thing about life. So many times, it seems like the enemy's winning. And I want to give you just a few theological background things. I've gotten some odd questions lately about things. Not odd, just um, they're not unusual questions. They just happen at different times. And so today we're going to talk about three truths about enemies. And we're not only going to look at what enemies do, I'm going to give you some verses. Are you ready for this? So that you can evaluate your own heart. Because if we're not careful, we always, in this story, we always think that we are Mordecai or Esther. We're the good guys. We never would suspect that we can be Haman, the evil one. And yet, if we're not careful, we can allow the enemy to use us. So, so I want to look at some verses and, and just make sure and let God look at our hearts and, and make sure that we're not there. 
So here's some questions that I've gotten this week or things that people have said to me. Life's not fair. Um, Why does God allow evil people sometimes to succeed? If you look at the very beginning of the story of Esther, remember, we're going to get to the end and remember Esther becomes the hero and everything goes well. But do you realize the story starts like a Disney movie? Her parents are dead. That's how the story starts. And so the very God who saves the Israelites, you ready? And we know that the whole point of this book is that God had his hand on the Israelites, yet he let her parents die. Well, does that mean God is not active? No. Well, then why did that happen? I don't know. And so in life sometimes, it, it, you can go from one or two extremes that God never influences the, the things that happen, which we know the Bible's very clear that he does, but we also know that Jesus did miracles for some people. And there's at least one time where people were showing up to see Jesus, and the next morning Jesus says, let's go somewhere else. So what happened to those people? I, I don't know. And how is that fair? I don't know. And it's okay to realize that you don't have all the answers and yet understand that God can still intervene. Does does that make sense? And so it's a big struggle for people. And so here's the thing. We need to make sure that we're aware of truths about enemies, and here's why, so that we can make wise choices. Because some of the things I'm going to say, you might be sitting there and going, that's my boss. That's... That's, oh wait, that's me, right? I hope that's not true. But it seems the enemy is winning, but the story isn't over. Now, remember, we start the book of Esther. uh, It's it's before Nehemiah, after Ezra is about time period. You've got Xerxes. He comes in. Remember, he's having a banquet. And what's he do? He gets all the politicians drunk, tries to bribe them. I mean, it's just like modern society, right? Tries to bribe them. And then he convinces them to go to war with him. He goes off to war. And just so you know, Xerxes is impulsive and he's not discerning. He listens to the wrong people. So he goes off to war and you can see the movie 300. I wouldn't encourage that, that movie. I can't even watch part of it. But just so you know, that's, that's what takes place next. And Xerxes listens to bad advice and destroys his entire navy, ends up having to retreat comes back to town, starts spending all his money to finish his dad's projects, starts doing other projects. He ends up bankrupting the, uh, uh, the empire, just so you know. And yet, in the middle of this, he comes back, and we pick up this story of Esther and what happens. And so that's what we're going to pick up today. And here's the first one. Power, when it comes to evil people, power and control are the goal. So we're going to pick up, and this is the part of the story, just like uh, 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 Princess Bride. By the way, how many people have seen Princess Bride? Right? So if you only saw that side, if you've never seen the movie and you watch that part, you're like, well, the good guy's going to lose. End the movie. And that's what it feels like. And that's where we're at in this chapter and in the next chapter. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamaditha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than all the other nobles. By the way, one of the reasons he might have done this is because he may have been, if not the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest people in the neighborhood. Does this sound like politicians to you? Right? Right? And so all of a sudden, people who have money all of a sudden have influence. How does that work? Oh, it's a shocker. Right? So... All, by the way, if you ever go to another church, and you're welcome to go to another church, be careful of pastors who look and try to find out how much money people make and that's who they allow to have influence in the church. I actually, my mom was at a church one time where they chose the people on committees based on not percentage they gave, how much they gave to the church. That's who got to have the most influence in the church. If you show up at a church like that, can I tell you what to do? Run, (laughs) run like the wind to be free again. All right, here we go. All the royal officials at the king's gate... I've got such a long way to go to make it to the border of Mexico. Okay, sorry. 
all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. So the king's like, you know, Haman, I like rich guys. I tell you what, everywhere you go, everybody's got to kneel down when you go by. And by the way, anybody who would say that's a great idea is a jerk. I'm just saying, right? Okay, so... But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Remember, Mordecai's the uncle, right? The uncle that raised Esther. He's the one that that hangs out. And now Esther is queen. Mordecai is still her uncle. He hangs out at the gate. That's where wise men hung out. And he says, they said, The royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, But he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. Why? For he had told them he was a Jew. So not only did Haman expect other people to bow to him, the people who were riding with Haman went and said, Hey, dude, you you get on one knee when he comes by. He's like, I can't. I can't bow to anybody else. Didn't you ever hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not know about Daniel? And by the way, they would have known about Daniel. And just to give you a little background, by the way, the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh from the area of Babylon. Huh, I wonder how those wise men knew about the future Messiah. So Daniel was very famous. They would have known that a Jew does not bow down to anyone, and yet what happened? They know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... Ended up with a fourth guy in the fire, and the king back then said, Hey, worship their God. Don't mess with these people. And now the opposite was happening. Why? Because of pride. Because of self-centeredness. Because of the desire for power. The desire for control. Beware of people that look to control others. And always check your motive. To make sure that your motive is out of love and not out of control. James 4.10 says it this way. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. It's easy to be self-promoting. It's easy to think that we are superior to others. And let me tell you how that looks in our society You're on Facebook and somebody posts something and you think, Wow, what a dummy. I thought they were smart. You immediately just said, I'm better than they are, I'm smarter than they are, I know more than they are, they do. See, I just messed up my English, that's how bad I am, right? And we have a tendency to think or to feel like we're better over the most trivial things. Somebody spells they're wrong and we're like, I never knew they were dumb. So... Are we allowing God to lift us up or are we lifting ourselves up? Number two, they seek to destroy. So not only power and control being the goal, they seek to destroy. And remember, it seems the enemy's winning, but the story is not over. You know, I've been a pastor for a long time and I went from uh, 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 just working at churches and helping at churches, volunteering at churches, to being a youth pastor for many years and then being a pastor. And I've now been a pastor for over 20 years, which is crazy to think about. And so I've been at churches where the deacons attacked me for something or did something or said something. Or, and sometimes, by the way, it was self-inflicted wounds. We one time had a, a, a messy Olympics And the kids all ran through the church after the Olympics. That was, I deserve that one. We had putting handprints on walls. It was awesome. Those kids still say it was the best time of their lives. I said, yeah, me not too. But sometimes it's self-inflicted. But the truth is, over the years, I've had deacons who wanted to get rid of me. I had a Sunday school class that accused me falsely of cussing in church, which is a hilarious story that I'll tell another day. Never knew Shaquille O'Neal sounded like a cuss word to people. And yet, over the years, these same people, what did they want to do? They wanted to destroy me. I'll never forget one pastor came and took over a church, and it was obvious within the first week that he didn't like me, and he started to do things to try to get rid of me. He started making me do things that none of the other staff 
had to do. He started making comments towards me that nobody else made. And you have worked, how many of you worked with somebody like this, right? That, right? Everybody, right? And so we all know people like that. Why? Because the enemy wants to destroy not just where you are, wants to destroy what you do. So pay attention. Listen, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Secret, pride is easily offended. When you are prideful, it is easy to get offended. My poor sister is a flight attendant. Can you imagine being a flight attendant on Friday? Because everybody felt like they had a right to do whatever. And so they mistreated other people. And it's so easy to do that, isn't it? Why? When pride rises up, we start thinking, oh, boy, I'm a better driver than you. How dare you drive in the left lane slowly? Right? Come on. You, you, you haven't... You have to take a drink during that part. I know. I see. I see it. All right. Yet, having learned who Mordecai's people were... Listen, it wasn't enough that he wanted to take Mordecai out. He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people. This is what pride does, by the way. It overreacts. The Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes, all the way through Babylon, the, the whole, what we would consider the world just about at that time, other than Greek areas. Revelation 9-11 says that Satan is the destroyer. Why? He wants to destroy your life. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pure, that is the lot. By the way, this is where we get the celebration of Purim, and I pronounce it wrong every time. And I talked to some folks who lived in Israel, and I said, I will never get it right because I'm a hillbilly, I can't even say naked the right way. And yeah, you got it. Okay, so was cast, so this, this lot was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and a month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there's a certain people dispersed among the people in all the province of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people. They don't obey the king's laws. It's not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be, is decree be issued to destroy them, and I'll give 10,000 talents of silver. By the way, that's about a quarter billion with a B dollars worth. Issued to destroy them. I'll give them 10,000 talents of silver to the king administrators for the royal treasury, which by the way, he needed the money, even though he's going to reject it in a minute. The truth is the king needed that money because he had just spent all his money on battles. But so what happens? So, so they cast a lot and the idea is that even in that, even in that lot being cast, God was present because it was almost a year later that the lot fell. And the celebration, the Jews still celebrate in about March or April every year, they celebrate a festival called Purim or Purim or however they pronounce it the right way. And the truth is they celebrate this and it means to cast a die. And they celebrate this and they wear masks and they make fun of what he tried to do. Why? Because God's people are going to be rescued. And yet, what does Haman do? Haman comes and says, there are these people and he gives them all these general things. Let me tell you something I know about enemy attacks. And not just Satan, but people. They tend to be general. They tend to be overarching and there tends to be nothing you can do about it. So that means that when you're praying and you're saying, God, I, I'm struggling in this area or I'm struggling with this emotion or I'm struggling with this situation or I'm struggling with this ailment right now, the enemy will whisper in your ear, you are a terrible parent, father, mother, teacher, neighbor, whatever it is. And guess what? When you just have this general, you're a terrible person, you can do nothing about it. I'll never forget years ago, I was working maintenance at a church and I went into one office and there was a pastor there and I said, hey, can I get your trash? And I got his trash and as I walked out, he said, hey, hey, I got to tell you something. And he called me to his desk and he said, God told me to tell you. By the way, when a sentence starts out that way, be very careful what flows next. He said, God told me to tell you, you ready? You're a pest. 
right? Don't worry, he's dead now. It's okay. He's met Jesus. Now, he apologized to me the next day. Partially because my boss lit him up that night. But anyway, but, but the truth is, he said that, and I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? He said, you're just a pest. I said, well, so let me tell you something about the enemy. You can't do anything to fix what he tells you. And so when Haman comes and he tells the king, he says, there's these people who do these things and they just aren't very likable. And the enemy will do that to you. Why? Because his whole point is to discourage you. To make it where if you're a terrible mom, you can't do anything about being a terrible mom. If you're a terrible dad, you can't do anything about being a terrible dad. If you're a terrible Christian, you can't do anything about being a terrible Christian. Let me tell you something about God. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, and every once in a while somebody will say, I don't think God speaks today. And I'm like, well, then how do you have conviction? Because conviction is when the Holy Spirit comes and says, you know how you talked to so-and-so yesterday? Yes. You need to apologize to them. It's specific. It's actionable. It brings repentance. It brings change. It brings reconciliation. But when the enemy attacks you, there's nothing you can do about it, and you're just a failure, and you're washed up. When God brings conviction, it changes you. It helps you to do what he's called you to do. By the way, this is why it's important that every day you take time to say, God, would you show me any sin in my life? Not so that God can condemn you, but so that the Holy Spirit can convict you. Why? So that you can change. God's not like in heaven going, you did what? When we confess our sins. But it's for us. He's helping us to grow and to change. And by the way, one of the things that confession does, as you confess specific things to God, it helps you to change. So if you have a bad attitude, if you're grumpy, if you're angry, and you're taking that anger everywhere you go, God's helping to change. The Holy Spirit is changing you. Now here's a verse to remind us to not be those same people who are trying to destroy others. Why? Because this is what the enemy does. The thief, it says in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. By the way, if you're a Christian and you start growing in Christ, the enemy is after you. If, if he's not after you, you're not making a difference in the world. But if you're making a difference in the world, the thief is coming after you. But listen to what Jesus says. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And that word for full is overflowing. So as God fills your life, the enemy tries to destroy you and God just keeps showing off. He gives you a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to be talking about that next week. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So here's your second set of questions to evaluate yourself. Lord, help me to lay down my life for other people. Lord, help me to be giving and not taking. Lord, help me to be bringing life to others. Help me to be bringing healing to others. And by the way, one of the ways to look is, what are my words? What are the things that I say? What are the things that I do? Am I bringing life to others or am I bringing death? Am I saying curses or am I saying blessings? And by the way, we all want to we all want to be Esther. We we all want to be Mordecai, but the truth is, if we're honest, sometimes we're Haman. Sometimes we're the one spewing out curses. Sometimes we're the ones bringing that. We get aggravated enough, and we want control enough, and we get angry enough. We say things that we instantly regret. Why? Because instead of building somebody up, what do we do? We tear them down. Why? Because they're in our way. And I would love to say we're never like Haman, but boy, I've been like Haman. Number three, they escalate confusion. Power and control are the goal. They seek to destroy, and then they escalate confusion. Now, what do I mean by that? How many of you have ever bought a car at a place that sells cars? I don't want to just say a car dealership. Most people. And so what do they do? You go in to see the guy, and if you've got a manipulative 
How many of you have ever dealt with a manipulative car person? Okay, a lot of people. So, so you go in, if you've got a manipulative person, what do they do? They come in, they talk to you, they start running numbers, they start asking you how much you're willing to spend, and they start doing all this stuff, right? And then what do they do? Then they have to go out and talk to somebody, which by the way, they're probably not going out and talking to somebody. They're probably going and talking to somebody, not about you, just about whatever, and giving you time to get wound up. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you all wound up and frustrated and tired, and then they try to get you confused so that you don't know what the numbers are so that when they come back eventually that you'll do something that in your right mind you would have never done. And so let me give you some advice because life is that way and when you're under pressure, listen, listen, when you're under pressure, you will make terrible choices. And so please listen, take your time in making decisions. Now, don't hear me the wrong way. I'm not saying never make a decision. <laughs> so don't hear that. You've got to make decisions. And sometimes there's a time limit on your decisions. But many times we get in a hurry to make a decision because we're aggravated, frustrated, overwhelmed, and confused. And so sometimes the very thing we need to do is say, God, would you give me your peace? Would you help me to walk in your peace? Listen to what happens next. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hanamatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. Time out. Do you realize that that, I mean, can you imagine if I just, and David actually took my checkbook one day and wrote his name on it and asked me to sign it as a joke. But can you imagine if I literally just handed David not only my credit cards, but my bank statement, all of my accounts, all of my money, and said, do whatever you want. A signet ring basically gave Haman the authority of the king to do whatever he wanted. It was his signature. It was his credit card. It was everything. And remember I said Xerxes didn't have much discernment. And he was compulsive or impulsive. By the way, you want to ruin your life, let those two things run you. And add anger to that, and you're really struggling. And so he gives him his signet ring, and then he says, keep the billions, keep the quarter of a billion, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. And basically he wrote up a law, uh, uh, Haman wrote up a law, uh, excuse me, yeah, Haman wrote up a law that basically said, on this date that they had already decided, you can kill anyone who's Jewish and take everything they own. And I, and I wonder if even that very day, as that went out, that some Jews moved, maybe. Did God even have to let it go this far? No. But once again, what's God doing? He's working things out for his good. I don't always like what's in between. I don't like the pit of despair that we saw in the video. By the way, I'm terrible. Kristen gets upset because I fast forward through the bad parts and the sad parts of movies. I'm like, let's get on to the good part. She's like, why? That's part of the movie. Yeah, it's not the good part. They're crying in this. We go, look, happily ever after. I like that part. <laughs> right? And so this is the sad part. And by the way, just, just side note before I get to the next verse. This might be your life right now. But God's not done yet. You, you might be going through a sad time, a hard time, a difficult time, and you don't know what's going to happen next. They didn't know. We know. We've already fast-forwarded to the end. We read the end of the story. We're like, oh, you're going down. But they didn't know that. Thank you, SunPass. Sorry, SunPass sent me a text. $25 charge. Somebody's using SunPass today. Good to know. And then it says this, a copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurned on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. So they just sent out an order to wipe out an entire race and the king cares so little about what just happened and Haman is so excited about what happened, they sat down and had a drink together after deciding that they would wipe out the Jewish race. It reminds me of the videos they have of Hitler after issuing edicts to basically wipe out the Jews of 
him partying up in the mountains. What does that happen? Because the enemy doesn't care about you. But my question to you is, do you care? If somebody doesn't vote the way you vote, do you hate them? If somebody doesn't think the way you think, do you hate them? If someone drives in the left lane slowly, sorry, that was for me, not for you. When we were leaving last night, some guy said to me, you really have problems driving. I go, oh, I'm so much better. You have no idea. 1 Corinthians 14, this is talking about order in the church, but it's just a great note about who God is in general. God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord people. So what does that mean? God's a God of peace. So sometimes you have to pray, God, would you give me peace? Lord, in the middle of confusion, in the middle of frustration, in the middle of making big decisions, in the middle, by the way, you can't control other people. So when other people make bad decisions, you know what? You have to let them make bad decisions. They're adults. I know. You you don't get to decide for other people anymore. And so sometimes you just have to say, God, would you give me peace? Even though I don't like what they're saying, even though I don't like what they're doing, would you help me to walk in peace? You know what Jesus said? He said, they will know your Christians by your love. That's what he prayed for the early church. He said, God, help them to know me by your love. Not by your anger, not by your righteousness, not by you thinking you're better than everybody else, which, you know, we all do that. But by our love. God, would you give me the peace that passes understanding? We have to make sure that we're aware of truths about enemies and make sure we're not there. Andy Stanley told a story about his dad, Charles Stanley. And about 60 years ago, Andy Stanley was was a little over 50 years ago. Andy Stanley was 13. His dad had been at First Baptist Atlanta, and he was the interim pastor. And one Wednesday night, a set of deacons wanted to get rid of Charles Stanley. And so they were getting ready to have Bible study, and this deacon stood up and said, I want to have a meeting right now. And so Charles Stanley said, okay. And that deacon came up, and he cussed, in the microphone, to which Charles Stanley stood up and said, we will not use profanity in this church. That deacon turned around and punched Charles Stanley in the face. Charles Stanley in the face, punched him in the face, to which Andy Stanley said, it was everything I could do not to run up and beat that guy up for my dad. Can you imagine at 13? And he said it was amazing. His dad didn't respond, didn't react, and just said, you will never cuss again in this church. They said after that day, nobody listened to that group of deacons anymore, and it wasn't long before Charles Stanley became the pastor of that church, and he stayed there for the next 50 years and grew that church and grew that ministry and made a huge difference. Why? Because he did not allow the attacks of evil to mess up his peace. Are you allowing the enemy to ruin your perspective on life? Are you forgetting that God is in charge even when you don't feel like it? Even when you say, yeah, but Esther's parents died. That doesn't make sense that her parents would die and God would save the entire Jewish community. Why didn't he save her parents? I don't know. Why would God save that person and not save that person? I don't know. But he's still in charge and don't forget that he is sovereign. So we have to say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If you're watching online, you can give us a call or text. I'd love to talk to you after church about what it means to be a Christian. The fact that Jesus died for our sins because we're not righteous on our own, only he is righteous. And so he gave everything so that we could surrender our lives to him. So today, if you're ready to follow him, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to follow Christ. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you're a Christian, but you struggle with all the things I talked about and you've always thought it's those other people. But maybe God today is convicting you about some things in your life. And so just be honest with him and say, God, I'm sorry. Repentance brings forgiveness. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you that we can look at a story that's thousands of years old and see what still happens, not only today, but even in our lives. 
So Lord, change us, work on us through your Holy Spirit. Bring conviction and love for each other. In Jesus' name, amen.